Hey, welcome back, everyone. Uh, that was fun. Thank you, John. Definitely. Good time, man. Um, so, yeah, special little Q&A here. If anybody's got any questions, um, we're here to answer them. Uh, so currently, that is only used on uh, Lightroom. The, the answer is no. Right. Okay. And a fixed lens bot, what would you be using? Can you repeat the question? Entry, so entry, entry level. level. I, it doesn't exist. I, you know, for, for me, if, if I was looking to try a Leica camera, uh, First of all, I wouldn't be afraid of buying a used camera. No, certainly not. Right? Especially so, like a right. So, um, looking at entry level, if you want autofocus, I would look for a Q, hmm. the first generation Q, 24 megapixel, uh, same lens as the Q2, uh, and just a great camera. Or if you're looking at a system camera, S. I mean the SL. SL, the original SL1. SL. Yeah. Yep. Which is also brilliant. Type camera. 601, great camera. And what was kind of nice is, is the, although the lenses have changed, like any, uh, there's no like system change where an SL no. lens won't fit no. on an older camera. So you know, the, the, it's true. Um, but the one thing about when, when when you say starter camera, the menus in the Leica camera are very simple. Um, sometimes when I think of a starter something, it means less buttons, less speed, less. Right something. Um, I don't think that really exists in Leica. If you buy a Leica camera, you're buying a Leica camera. Right. And maybe a newer camera might take photos a little faster, or the, the sensor technology will be changing, but you're not going to be upset with something that you think, oh, if I upgrade to this, I'm going to right. get a, a million times better. Yeah, I mean, if you wanted manual focus, going with going like an, 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 an M240, M8, M8, um, <laughs> M9, uh, Really, I mean, they're nice cameras and they have definitely a, a, a following. But to me, the M240, MP240 are at a point where the technology was advanced enough where you could still shoot at 1600, 3200. Right, whereas, ISO, whereas you were struggling on the higher ISO. M8, but like really all struggling. digital cameras at that yeah, time. Exactly. Um, another, th th this is funny, I, when I first got my Q, uh, the very first Q mm -hmm. that came out, I, I love this camera, and I, I don't shoot 28 mil, but I love a camera in my bag, and I, I love to have a real camera with me. Um, and my wife was going to the park to take some photos of my kid. I said, hey, try this camera. And I put it on automatic for right. her, and I, I set it on aperture, pri aperture priority, automatic ISO, and right. whatever. And I gave her, and she said, what do I do? Just aim, press the button, right. that's it. And she came back and she had taken like 30 of the best photos of my kid I'd ever <laughs> seen in my life. And That's they had, the good news. They had the Leica feel. <laughs> right, right. And they, they had the Leica look of the, the, the bouquet and everything. Right. I thought, oh my God, this shouldn't be allowed. You have to work for that look. So the next time she went in to borrow the camera, I just knocked it off autofocus and didn't that tell her. That was very nice. It was very not nice. And other focus, photos are out of focus, yeah. and she's never forgiven me for that. So, yeah, so pretty much. Yeah. Uh, something else? Yes. Uh, Mark. Yes. Uh, my favorite focal length for portraits has been completely altered um, in the last hour. Uh, listen, um, when I used to shoot, before I shot Leica, before I shot medium format Leica, I would shoot medium format with an 80 millimeter lens. Um, that was a Contax. I thought that was absolutely my favorite. Then I tried a Hasselblad 100, classic Hasselblad 100 on the Contax and I loved the 100. And then when I started shooting my S system, I started shooting with all my old contacts lenses and I loved the 80. And then I borrowed the 120 from somebody for a minute and there was no way back for a long, long time. That's maybe where I've been for the last six or seven years. Mm -hmm. But today shooting that 100 on my S, um, is really <laughs> it's a nice lens it's it's a, it's a really beautiful yeah. lens i'm yeah. gonna have to actually play with it a little more maybe john will lend me it for a week or so sure 
Wow. And, uh, you know, but I, I like it. I, I like on the medium format, like a hundred. But this is weird what we're saying because I've been educated about this today. Um, it's a hundred on the medium for it's a hundred on 35. 35, but on the medium format, it's about an 85. 80. 80. So my 120 is a 120 on 35 mil and about a 95 on the 120. So right. I think on medium format, it's fair to say that I like the focal length of around 85 to 95. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's my happy place. Like monochrome, and if not, would you shoot in black and white or color in this uh, The S3 does color only. It's color only, and the and SL, same with the SL2. SL2. It's color only. Um, absolutely, I would shoot in color. Um, there's a, couple of, there's a couple of things that I do with my Leicas that uh, w with my um, mirrorless Leica, the SL2, is if I know I'm having that black and white day, then I'll set my, my, my EVF to only show me what's in black and white. So I'm actually actually shooting in black and white, in black and white. If you're using a, a regular camera with a glass viewfinder, you're still seeing in color, but shooting in black and white, like with the M10, uh, the M10 monochrome, right. your viewfinder is glass, so you're still seeing in color. Um, with the EVF cameras or the mirrorless, or the the digital cameras, the mirrorless digital cameras, you can actually set your EVF to be black and white and your JPEGs to be black and white. At the end of the day, you have a color RAW file which you have to convert, but you can still get the experience of only seeing in black and white. Yeah. Am I, am I? No, you got it, yeah, so what you would do is you're gonna change your JPEG settings to monochrome and on the SL2, there's two monochrome settings. There's the a standard and a high contrast. Right, so. yeah. No, it's, uh, it's, it's a way, um, a lot of photographers, even if they're not going to convert to black and white, they want to see in black and white because they want to eliminate color from their photographic process right. of excitement. You know, when we shoot, we go out and we're looking, we're all attracted to different things. Some people, you know, it, it bright color and then they come back and look at their images and they're like, what did I get here? It's, you know. It's, yeah. it's not what I saw. Right. Uh, so one step to help eliminate that is to do what you do and just see in black and white and then, then have that experience. Yeah. Yeah. Um, once again, another thing that uh, is kind of important is that I've definitely been shown comparisons between black and white conversion from an M10 to uh, the black and white monochrome. Now, in all honesty, it comes down to that minutia again. I'm not uh, knowledgeable enough to understand micro contrast and all these things that people talk about. Um, and yeah, I can see a difference. I can certainly see an out of camera difference, but somebody who's really good at converting and doing something can get something that looks very similar. So um, once again, I said this earlier, I think it's more about the feel of knowing that you're only shooting in black and white mm -hmm. that, that makes sense for only a black and white I mean, it's a, real, it's a really personal yeah. decision yeah. to shoot only black and white. Um, I know the, the amount of grief I, I get when I want to go to a family event and only shoot in black and white, and I ask, where's the color? And I said, well, you saw it in color, now you can see it in black and white. And that's your memory forever. <laughs> And then when I get up off the floor after somebody knocks me out, right. uh, I'm looking mm. around for my monocle. I'm still <laughs> shitting. <laughs> um, yes, Jacob? Do you shoot in, uh, with auto white balance or custom white balance in the studio? Uh, good question. Um, and my answer is I would like to say that good practice is always to shoot a gray card. Um, then it doesn't really matter uh, because you can always get to a white balance. Um, if I'm if I'm if I'm doing something that is important and other people are watching what I'm do doing, which happens quite often, 99 times out of 100, I will shoot a gray card and balance everything off that gray card before I 
before I start. And I can guarantee that I will make adjustments on that gray card, maybe to make it warmer or maybe to make it a little colder. But the, the, the best, most important practice is shoot a gray card or a white card before you start. Strobes are all different, heads are different. Um, sometimes you have two strobe heads from different manufacturers. So uh, worth shooting a gray card so you can at least get as close to white balanced as you start. Um, you can also do that uh, in, 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 in camera, in, in set, camera uh, obviously. Yep, you can set a, a gray point in camera, but with a target. Yeah, and with Capture One, uh, you can either set a gray point from your photograph, or you can actually uh, get control of your camera right. and be able to set it there. So it's very, very nice integration that you, you actually have all your camera controls on your computer if you're doing still life or, or, or you're shooting fast fashion and your digitech or somebody sees that your 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 uh, f-stop might be a little long or your shutter speeds he can change it while you're shooting or you can change it yourself which is super cool. How can you reproduce the Leica high contrast film style? I'm going to throw that right over here. <laughs> I, Mark, aren't you selling your presets today of Leica looks? No, no, I don't no. need to. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, it's. I imagine you can do it. I, I've never, I've never tried it. Uh, you know, the, the what I like is the high contrast JPEG that the SL2 and SL2S produces in camera as a JPEG. I think is very, uh, very realistic um, and really good. So well, that's kind of what what I do. But a lot of your work is in your black and white is pretty high contrast. Yeah, what, what, I, would, what I would say is that for me, the Leica look comes from the lens. Yeah. Um, so you've got the lens. Um, you know, back in the day when we were shooting film, the color and the contrast, a lot of it came from the lens and then the film. So right. different films had different color uh, and also spaces. also chemistry, how you processed it. How you processed it. So, I feel personally I get the Leica look from my lens and my color space, but if you were to talk to one of the old schools like Bruce or somebody who's gone from film to digital, right. um, I think uh, he would definitely have some tricks up his sleeve for how he does that. or does maybe. He maybe. Or he might leave it exactly out of camera. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah. Don't know. We don't know. Uh, yes, I can. Oh, you want the explanation? <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, so what it does is it will take a series of eight images in extremely quick uh, succession, and it utilizes the electronic shutter. Uh, what the camera then does is it will take those eight shots and put them all together into one file that's 187 megapixel. That when you open it up in Photoshop, gives you something on the long edge about 55 inches at 300 DPI. So good for Texas size wallet prints. Um, so a couple, a couple things. One is since it's using the electronic shutter, uh, the longest exposure you could use is uh, one second. Uh, the camera also has to be mounted on a tripod uh, and it's extremely sensitive. So. Whenever uh, I use it, I set my camera up, frame everything, and the last step that I do is to put it into multi-shot. So when it's uh, capturing the image, you have a choice of uh, having the camera eliminate artifacts. So artifacts would be, as the camera is assembling these eight images, any differences or delta bits to the image are dropped out. So let's say a leaf moves on a tree. Right. It if would just take the leaf from the very first capture, mm. and then that goes that goes in there. So you do get that one large file, and you also get one 47 megapixel DNG. John, have you tried a portrait on it? I have not. I've done uh, still life, uh -huh. and we've done flowers, but I think that would be uh, something really cool to to play around with. Um, uh, how long does it take to create the images? So if you uh, have the artifacting turned on, mm -hmm. 
uh, when you hit the shutter to the next time you can sh hit the shutter is about 19 seconds. Wow. With it turned off, it's about 12 seconds because it's capturing those images obviously very quickly. But, but then, then it's the assembly. Right. So we're one of the few manufacturers that actually does that assembly in camera. So you don't need special software. You don't have to do it on a computer at a later date. But we don't know the, like what percentage of that 12 or 19 seconds is taken in the capture and what is in the process. Well, it, chances are it's less than a second. Because you think if you're at 1, 2, 50 and it takes eight shots, so that's eight, yeah. 50 or right. so it, like real so time nice for the, right. Yeah. Uh, we should try portrait with that. We'll yeah. do that next time. Yeah, that'd be we'll cool. The, uh, the other thing is that Capture One supports it as well as Lightroom. So, oh, cool. So even if you were a product photographer, uh, like I, I know I we should, have some mutual friends that are product photographers. I should product, they're just people. <laughs> true, true. Um, or, uh, yeah, so since it is supported by Tether, it's, it's a way to get really big files Cool. by doing that. Jakey. Oh, wow. Uh, so with every benefit comes a negative. Um, <laughs> what are the key benefits of Tether? Um, if you're a street photographer and that's what you do, I would say that tethering is only going to be a hindrance to you. Yeah, you know what, though? What? If you use the Photos app, yes. you can be a really good street photographer. And see your stuff live. Yeah, yeah, that's, so a whole, that's another hold, episode, right, John. Right, yeah. so you hold the phone and the camera's pointing this way and people think you're checking your email but you're, you're shooting yeah. tethered. <laughs> Advantages. Um, on Complicated Things a couple of weeks ago, we did this uh, $100 camera challenge uh, where I bought an old film camera for 50 bucks. Um, I put a roll of film in it and I exposed it. It's coming up soon. Now, I had absolutely no way to know if anything I was doing, I didn't know if the shutter was working properly, the aperture was working. Listen, if you have a modern camera, you, you, you might not have to worry about that so much. But then Polaroid came, or Fujiroid, or Fujifilm, and you got an opportunity to make an exposure and to see your picture. Um, and 999 times out of 100, you would do 10 Polaroids, and you'd pull it, and the client on set would go, oh my God, that's the one, I love it. Can you do that on film? And to be honest, you would have no idea if you could do it on film. What's great about tethering is that it is right there. That is your photograph. Um, now, however good you are, however good your eyes are, um, looking on the back of a, a little three inch uh, uh, LCD monitor, you cannot say, is that sharp? Yeah. Like if I say, you know, right now, is that sharp? The answer is yes, it's sharp. So for tethering, for me, in a professional atmosphere where there's more than just me that cares about what's happening on set at that moment. Also tethering right now, because we've been separated and my creative director or maybe my client is not in the studio, instead of emailing JPEGs, we can give them a, a, a Capture Pilot, which allows them to see what I'm doing somewhere else. So these are all great, great advantages um, to keep your client happy. The problem is taking a photo and having everybody on set see what mistakes you make as w instead of just being able to go, oh, crap, <laughs> <laughs> delete. Um, so that's the disadvantages. Um, I think it's also really nice to do this and, you know, c c like if I, Paul, can you bring up four together? Any four you like. To be able to do this, see what you're doing, see what your succession is. Um, well, that's really <laughs> pretty. Um, so, so, yeah. So let's say that back in the day, let's say you're shooting for a website and they're telling you that the website dimensions are 16 by 8 or whatever, 16. 60 wide by nine, and the logo is going to be here, here, and here. You can bring an overlay up in your computer screen and take photos and make sure that what you're capturing is working with the layout of what your client is going to work with. 
um, huge advantage because once again you'll take a great photo and they'll say oh we can't use that the logos right there so it's just uh, uh, that for me is what tethering is all around about but you know I've been doing a personal project recently where I'm shooting a hundred people uh, I'm not going to tell you about the project but I'm shooting hundreds of people and so much of the delight for me is taking the photos and then saying hey come here and going through them and showing them what I've captured. And I see the delight, I see the, the happiness in their faces that we're doing right. And then when I send them back onto set, I can get another set of photos and they feel confident and they feel good about how they look. So I think that pretty much sums up tethering. Again, if you haven't tried it, um, and you know, you, like I had, like a, and Capture One have made tethering very, very, possible and solid. Um, we're going to give away two licenses. Um, also, I think Capture One is a 30-day trial, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, you could sign up on the website. And yeah, you, could do a trial. you get a trial. It's worth trying and playing with. Um, it's also really nice to get an idea of what your post-processing is going to look on set. Um, otherwise, and you know, it, it's just that weird thing of like taking your camera and showing it to somebody like this so um, I love it I love how my image is big anyway having them big on a screen is great yes sir next question um, do the other L-mount lenses like Panasonic and Sigma compromise the quality of the image compared to the Leica SL lenses uh, what I would say is all these lenses render differently Right, right. And so very, very diplomatic. Well, I think all these lenses are very sharp. I've shot a lot of the Sigma and a lot of the Panasonic lenses. They're all very sharp. The real difference that I see to my eye is that transition between uh, plane of focus and foreground and background. And how do they make a lens uh, render those out of focus bits? So what, what does the bokeh look like? And it's, it's different. Um, it's different than what Leica does. So to me, the, the greatest advantage of L-mount, uh, just kind of as we saw like a little sliver here, is again getting back to the artist's visual signature. And there are certain lenses that people identify with because that's how they're seeing. So I, I'm, I'm certainly no expert in this, but once again, from my gut of trying right. l yeah. lenses the the lenses from uh, Sigma and so on are incredibly sharp yeah um, but I feel they're very clinical I feel that there's no there's not character and I feel that most of the Leica lenses are all the ones that I own have character and they have something about them that you can identify as having the Leica look yeah. so I don't think you're going to compromise in sharpness necessarily. No, no it's, it's really the bokeh and but, how that looks and how, Yeah. to me a yeah. lot of times uh, the, the difference, like if you're going through and trying to identify, is when you're looking at a Sigma or Panasonic lens, the bokeh is, is different. It's, it's more uh, boisterous. It's, it's brighter clinical. in the image. It's clinical. It sings more. It's clinical. <laughs> It's, it, it, it lacks the uh, Leica creamy sharpness. Yeah, and um, it's, I'm not saying you can't get there yeah. with some post-production and some settings, but, you know, when well, Leica... it's learning the lens, too. Yeah. You know, uh, shooting oh. it wide open, but at different distances, you know, you can tame that, don't, controlling your background, that kind of thing. But when Leica bring out a lens that's this size and this heavy, it's for a reason. Right. I mean, and that was the whole thing with the L-mount, uh, right. which uh, the design of which went back, I guess, almost or a little more than 10 years ago. And the first camera that we introduced was 2014. It was an APS-C, the Leica T. Uh, the idea of designing this mount uh, was how big does this mount have to be so that we wouldn't have any or limited compromises to optical design. So any lens that we would decide we want to make, the L-mount works with, and it's optimized for autofocus, which 
up until then, we really we had the S that was autofocus, but nothing in 35. So, right. Uh, oh, we have so more. Big stuff. Uh, do you think it will ever be fast enough compared to wider? All right. So the question is, uh, do I feel that wire, wireless tethering will ever be as fast as wired tethering? Um, I think so. I think so at yeah, some point. I mean, it's, at some point. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, we're, I think we're beginning to approach that with, you know, Wi-Fi's that are, like, what, a gigabit we're up to? Um, you know, it's, I, I think the bottleneck is in the speed of the Wi-Fi, yeah. not in the speed of the ability of the yeah. camera. And what we're doing with uh, Bluetooth over Wi-Fi to help uh, keep that connection uh, and try to make that connection more stable. Um, and let's face it, as a photographer, wouldn't you want to tether without any wire? Of course but I the would. question would be, would that be tethering? Bum, bum, bum. It would be wireless, da, da, da. <laughs> um, but in saying that, on the six or seven times I've used the photo, photos, photos app, app um, and I've been shooting just from your device, my device, uh, although I'm not getting a DNG onto my device, I'm seeing the JPEGs quick enough to make it a worthwhile pursuit. So another option. Yeah, definitely. Mark, I've got a question for you. Yes, sir. You as a photography god. <laughs> okay, so to, imbecile. You know, it would be, you know, Eric Clapton is god. <laughs> Mark Mann is photo god. What camera do you use for uh, your you personal? You can have asked me what camera I use when I photograph Eric Clapton, but I haven't photographed Eric Clapton, so I can't answer that. No. Uh, you know what? What's the camera that lives in my bag? My everyday camera that I carry with me everywhere? A Leica Q2. So I would say that is on my personal photos, um, the photos of my kid, the photos of my wife when she's shouting at me. Mm. Um, what do you hang like on about one sec. <laughs> okay. Um, what is it that you like about the Q2? I love the Q2 because it's just versatile and it's there and it's easy and it's small and it just makes me pictures that if once in a blue moon, and it is a blue moon, I take a reasonable photograph with it, it's right. not a bloody phone picture. Right. It's a real picture and yeah. I can make a print or, or do something with it. And it, it, it's the, the, the difference in the mentality for me of holding a camera and holding my phone. Don't get me wrong, I hold my phone a lot and make pictures, take pictures. But when I'm holding my camera, I'm in a different mind space. Folks, once again, that was a lot, a lot of fun. Huge thank you to John Kreidler, who I'm proud to say is my friend, and also uh, the Leica product spe pro product specialist and part of the Leica Academy. Again, thank you to Paul here, who is a Capture One uh, expert um, and has, well, that looks really pretty. Coco left the building already because she had another appointment. Grace, Manny, and Jacob, who helped with everything else. Thank you all. Um, and we will announce the winner of the uh, by email. So look out for an email. Thank you all again, and we will see you next time. Listen, you. if you have any ideas of stuff you want us to cover, um, please send them in because we're all about trying to do stuff that you guys want to see. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Are we still alive?